Hello, welcome. My name is Colin Crowley with Coaching Again, and today I'm just going to go through a nursery coaching uh, presentation. So, working with kids from four to seven uh, in a GA setting um, in the GA clubs. So, the aims of the workshop or of the presentation are to introduce fun games and activities for warm up and fundamental movements, to introduce simple game concepts to ensure that children have fun, and to design games to focus on skill development in hurling and football, and obviously easily compare brought over to Camogie and Ladies Football as well. So, uh, fundamental movement to warm-up games. So what we what I have here is just a list of games which you may already be aware of or may, may not be aware of, but what we would use that are very simple, very easy to use, and uh, parents, coaches can use these to get uh, the kids in warmed up for the start of activities and also that they're beneficial to the fundamental movement skills that children need uh, as part of growing up. So chase games including flush the toilet, under the bridge, turtles, stuck in the mud, frogs. Um, you can find all these games online. Uh, they're basically a concept of chase games where there might be one quarter of the group might be a catcher, three quarters of the group would be off. If the catcher gets caught, such as flush the toilet, uh, or if the catcher catches someone and flush the toilet, the person has to do some sort of a movement and to be set free, they have to be they have to be moved another way. So let's say for flush the toilet, very simple, a child gets caught, they put their hand out like that and to set them free, one of their teammates pushes the hand out. So very simple flush the toilet. Most people are familiar with stuck in the mud, which would be opening up their legs and someone crawls underneath them to set them free. Um, under the bridge is something similar. Turtles is just a child. Once they get caught, they lie on their back with their hands and legs wiggling in the air and they're set free by somebody rolling them over. And frogs is when they go down on all fours on the ground and somebody frog jumps over them and set them free. So they're just basic, simple concept games, but there's a lot of movement involved and I'll go through that in a little bit. The uh, likes of Bulldog, for animal movements, Simon says, uh, monkey's tails, which should be using a bib tucked into the shorts or into the sides of the pants or the back of the pants. Um, and there's many different variations of that, be it everybody has a bib and you're all, it's elimination or a quarter of the group don't have bibs and they must try to get the bibs off everybody else. Um, and so there's many different variations of how you do that game and likes cups and saucers, which is just using cones, half of them turned upside down, half of them drive around, group split into two and they must turn the cones over and back. So what, what, what all those games are doing is they're getting multi-directional movement into the kids. Um, and ask and just most challenging the kids in slightly different concepts in each game. So whilst all these games do not use hurling and hurley or football, they are highly specific to GA and the fundamental skills needed by children to excel, not just in GA and sport, but also to enable a better quality of life as people age. Skills that are applicable to these games that benefit sport are the following. You have acceleration, deceleration, agility, balance, coordination, sprinting, twisting, jumping, sidestep, squat lunge etc you can see them all there teamwork peripheral vision communication cooperation so everything done in a simple game of flush the toilet will actually help a child when participating in sport um, regardless of the sport so what on top of that you can also come up with various different games uh, this is just one that we did with ty's a few years ago and it's basic simple of, um, of tag but they're in groups of two or three so as you can see, the group on the left there, the three lads, they're actually the catchers for the start. So if they catch someone, that person then becomes the catcher. So I'll just let it play and you can see it working out. Um, so once you get caught, you become the catcher. Uh, so again, the three lads are back on here. It takes a small bit of communication to get benefit, but you can see there's multi-directional movement and there's a skill set challenge for the players. And also you can hear there's a lot of shouting and roaring, which is shows it's a bit of fun. Um, so just different ideas that you can do is there's probably no right and wrong one, but just challenging them in different ways. So things to consider when designing a warm-up game. So, so going back to the last the last slide where um let's say non-traditional one, but is it fun? And if it's fun, it's off to a good start. Is there an increased heart rate? Do the kids have a lot of movement involved that their heart rate is, is raising and that they're getting, they're getting small but breathless? And is there multi-directional movement? So by ensuring that they're doing multi-directional movement, um, they're, they're working loads of different muscle groups within the game. So if you just, any warm-up game that you're trying to do with kids, um, and with any age group really, 
if it works on those three, if it hits those three topics, then it kind of works out as a good game. But as I said, the most important thing is fun. We don't want to go back to a stage where we were 20, 30 years ago of doing two laps of a pitch as a wall. Um, so we want to get into this game, game specific, sport specific stuff where multi directional movement and increased heart rate. And that'll lead to a good wall up game. So for you, if you just look at those three things and bring them into any game you have, can it apply? And if it does, then you're, you've got a good, good game to play with. So age appropriate skills, I know this comes up as one of the Twitter questions later on. Um, I suppose this is a model. It's a small bit taken from the Kilmurray of Brick, and I think it was um, when they got to the Ireland. I think they got to the Ireland semi final or Munster final a couple of years ago, and they met with the RT were down. Marty Morris, he was down with the coaching with the club, and he said, "What do you do? How do you small club in Clare get to be so successful in football?" And one of the things they did was they focused on developing three skills each year um, through child development, so that not trying to do in football, let's say solo, hand pass, near hand tackle, block down, high catch, all in one year. They introduced them year on year. So at the age of five, six, seven, they introduced three new skills. And as you go up to about 10, they'll be after getting an introduction to all the basic skills needed to perform um, competent game at Gaelic football and hurling. So working off that model, um, just something similar here, as you can see, it's very simple. In each of the codes, hurling and football, we have a core skill. And this core skill in hurling is always striking, and the core skill in football is always kicking. And if we can um, focus on that, as making sure that that gets at least 20 to 30 percent of each training session that's fairly important um, it's it's very easy and it has happened an awful lot in the last sort of 20 years where those key skills have been neg they've been neglected um in favor of i suppose shorter hand passing a lot of jab lifting and hurling um close passing of football and stuff like that so get back to working on those skills as the core skills so ground striking her or for a five-year-old working on the ground striking hurling ground kicking football um and, and that should be the minimum target for the year i'm not saying that's about all you should do for the year but if you have a group of five-year-olds you'd like that all of them are competent kicking left and right on the ground by the end of the year five if they progress and they progress a little bit faster you can obviously bring them forward and you can advance their their challenges but what i suppose what i'm looking at here when you say there's one key skill and the uh, three associate skills is that uh, a child who isn't competent at the start of the year, if he focused on dim skills just throughout the year, by the end of the year, they should be competent at those skills in a basic setting. Um, I'm not saying under pressure or somebody trying to tackle them, but I'm just saying uncontested dish, we have to execute those skills. So as I said, for the likes of, um, as you can see, for under seven football there, you get to pick up the hand pass and the block down. If we're introducing those three skills and we're putting a high focus on them, by the end of the year, we'll be fairly competent. You'd like to think the kids will be competent at those skills. Um, it'll also make your coach a little bit easier that you can focus every week on exactly what you're doing. So the beauty also, the beauty of hurling in football is that when you never ever do a skill in isolation. Um, and what I mean by that is if I'm kicking the ball to somebody over 20 yards away, that person is doing a different skill. So they're either catching it, if it's going along the ground, they're doing a pickup. Um, same in hurling, if they're controlling it, uh, stopping the ball so there's key complementary skills all the time associated with hurling and football so you're never um, leaving out any skill just because we're working on let's say for under five football where you have to bounce the little chest catch and we're throwing passing the ball to each other there's also with the ground kick um, they're working on those skills so when they get to six seven the skills that they learned in five are still going to be practiced as part of the exercise and activities so they're just games, um, you can screen, take notes of that if you want, but I think, I wouldn't say they're the perfect skills to be working at the age, but they're, I think they're a nice concept to start off. Um, and as you, as a coach and in a club, you can use that as a base and mix and match, chop and change a small bit to take them away, um, put in different skills at different age groups and stuff like that. Or add a skill or take away a skill if you want to make it two skills per year or four skills per year. But I suppose the important thing is that when you get a child at four, four, five or six, you've probably got 14, 15, 16 years of actually developing them. Um, and you shouldn't try to just get everything done in the sake of in the space of one, two, three years, because they've got they'll be playing in 20 years time, you'd like to think. So once they develop a bit every year, that's important rather than trying to develop too much too soon and not being able to develop any further once they get to the later age. So using games to develop skills, 
so what I'd like to, these are kind of concepts that I like to use. Um, I'm not saying I do it wholly 100%, but I'd like to think that um, these are kind of targets that I'd like to get. So there's six things here. One, is it fun? I think it's very, very important that nursery gate-based stuff is fun and engaging for kids. If it's not fun, the kids just won't come back. Um, at the age of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 19, I suppose up to 12, the kids are being brought down to the GA club, they're being dropped there by the parents. They're encouraged. If the kids aren't enjoying it beyond this age group, they're going to stop. They'll stop coming themselves when they can make up their own mind. But I think it's very important nursery. There's no all Ireland's to be won. There's no cups. There's no championships. It's important that it's fun. The kids have a really good introduction to sport. It has to be engaging for them. And what I mean by that is that there's lots of ball context, which comes down towards the end. Um, Age-appropriate content. So we're not teaching our four-year-olds or five-year-olds how to solo the football or solo the slitter when it's not really appropriate to be teaching them at that age, whereas they should be working on skills such as kicking, um, catching, bouncing, basic skills that will introduce them to the sport and they won't be at a risk of failing to execute the activities. So I remember John Morrison used to always say that um, one of the problems that a lot of clubs and counties had was that they were teaching kids to solo the football too soon and that their technique for kicking a football in was hindered because of it. So teach the kick in and the age appropriate stuff earlier and add those complementary skills later. Um, winning, what I mean by winning, um, and I just said well ago that it's not all about winning and losing the championship, but what I mean is that there's a concept that there's a competition element to the activities. So if you're playing games in a training session, that there's a winning, but you're doing multiple games. That It's not going out playing one match where there's going to be half the team or half the group of winners and half are losers. You're playing loads of games throughout the, act, throughout the day where kids are getting a chance to deal with success and failure in a small so setting with their peers. Um, so instead, if they're playing 10 different games or 10 different activities in the session and they win four or five of them, those kids are going to go home remembering the four or five they win, um, not the four or five they lose. So have a bit of a competition element um, by using games. So I'll go through that a little bit further. Um, skill development, know what you're trying to get out of. So out of the ex ex activity. So a lot of times we just do activities because we've seen them done by somebody else and we think that they're appropriate and they're good. But a lot of the time, they're not, um, we're not focusing on an actual skill development. We don't know why we're doing it or what we're doing it for. So go back to the, the age appropriate skills. What you're trying to work on for the year is that ticking the box for one of them. If it is, great, let's keep doing it. And again, just mentioned it already, lots of ball contacts. So where a child is getting multiple ball contacts every minute. They're not touching the ball once every three or four minutes. They're not lined up in groups of five waiting to get a go to catch the ball that the coach throws at them and hand pass it back. That they're actually playing, they can do that in some sort of a game setting outside of just standing in a line. So lots of ball contacts where there's lots of balls around and the kids get lots of active options to get to play. So the core skills, as I outlined already in hurling, you got the striking and football, the kicking, and you got various progressions there. Ground strike, striking the ball, striking the movement ball, striking on the run, and a football ground kick, which might progress to bounce kick for some kids, punt kick, punt kick on the run. Um, so what I'll go through is just going to go through a bunch of games that, that I like to use, and I think they're basic. Um, I think if, you're, if you base your nursery session around any of these games, they should be appropriate. Um, the first one is No Man's Land. It is my go-to game at all coaching workshops, um, coaching all teams. Is that there's probably 40 variations of the most basic, which we're looking at here on the screen, to up to what you'd be doing with probably 14s, 15s, which could be six versus six either side of a of a of an area, um, and essentially a match. So there's massive progressions, but as a, the basic, and this can be done hurling or football. Um, so this is uh, this one is outlined for hurling. Is you have a group of red on the left, group of white, yellow on the right. Um, there's a gap in between, so depending on the quality of the group and their competence levels, the gap in the middle gets bigger or smaller. So for five and six year olds, it might just be a line of cones. For eight year olds, you might have a 10, 12 yard, uh, 12 meter gap between the two squares. So all you're doing is throwing in all the balls and the kids are trying to hit every single ball into the opposition's square. Whichever team at the end of the time, so one minute, two minutes, three minutes, has most amount of balls in their square are the losing team. So when I'm doing this, I'd like to do, I might do three rows of it. The red team wins the first game. I'll make sure the yellow team wins the second game. The third game might be a draw. Everybody's happy. The kids will catch on to it after a while, but everybody wins a little bit. So there's the joy of yeah, the joy of winning the match or winning the competition in the game, um, but also 
if they do lose, it doesn't hurt against Jackson straight away. They're happy and they're engaged again. The more balls, the better. Um, and the same in football, where they're kicking the ball over and back, left leg, right leg, whatever leg they can get, um, try to encourage as much movement as possible. This is where you can do the focus, where you've got skill, kids that are very good. If you've got a, a child who's excellent, probably two years further advanced than the rest of them because they've got a few older brothers, they've been playing since they can walk. Um, that's where you set that child a challenge, that you only want him kicking with his weaker foot. But you can also go to the child that struggles, the child that's only a new, um, and you can actually work one-on-one with him and teaching him the exact basic techniques, the hands, the head, hands, feet, what's he doing, um, start on the ground, progress to a bounce kick, and stuff like that. So the likes of No Man's Land is a great place to give one-on-one coaching and to utilise your coaches to work on that. Uh, but as I said, brilliant game, lots of kicking, lots of striking. should be a variation of it in every single training session. Um, so in the video here, now we did it in the primary school. Um, so this is Harley, this is our junior and senior infants. And as you can see, you know, the, the grip on a lot of them wouldn't be ideal, but the hurleys that we use are actually hurl oaks, um, and they're very, very small. And you can see there's some of them use one hand on the hurley, uh, and I wouldn't discourage this because generally what they do is they put their dominant hand on top. So the smaller the hurley, the more likely they'll go one handed dominant hand on the hurley. So they're not putting the, the non dominant hand on top, and that leads to further complications as they get older. So, very simple game. Uh, there's two lines. You get the blue and the yellows on one side, the green and reds on the other side. They're not supposed to go into the middle, um, and you're supposed to hit the balls over and back. So you can see there was a lot of movement there. Kids seemed happy, lots of ball contacts. Next game is over the bar, so it's exact variation of no man's land, except we're putting in a goals in between the two areas, um, just for football. For hurling, you, or you could do hitting through a goals. Um, but for football, very simple, they're just kicking the ball, punt kick over the bar. You know, what I've seen with a lot of clubs, a lot of people they do is they actually knock the goals on its side so that they're just working um, working over a one meter high bar as opposed to a, to a two meter high bar. So it makes it easier and it gives more um, success for the kids. But the exact same concept is just gone through well ago um, with no man's land. Next one is goal to goal. Again, very simple concept. All of us are very aware of it. Two people just get a goal each, try to score into the opposition person's goal. Set up the length of area um, appropriate to the to the skill level of the players and how far apart um, it needs to be. So for five rolls, it might only need to be six, seven metres. Um, for eight rolls, they might be going up to 12, 14 metres and so on and so on. But it gets lots of ball contacts. Um, one ball between two, lots of ball contacts. I'm working on some key skills of striking the ball with a target in mind and also being able to stop the ball. Um, which is a key concept, a key skill for the for developing hurling. Next game, um, bouncy bouncy. So it's just a football and it's dribbling, dribbling, essentially a dribbling game um, where they're just bouncing the ball. And what we have there is you've got loads of cones or um, dots which the kids go out and they bounce the ball around. So in pairs, anywhere around the square, one person will be going while the other is waiting. I said if you have enough footballs, everybody can go at the same time. So the coach might say, three red cones um so the player has to go and bounce the ball at three red cones the person might say uh, and as that progresses you might go to county colors uh, colors of country flags so as with slightly older kids let's say six sevens eights if they're familiar what color of the france flag so if you red white blue they'll go to that so there's a small bit of learning involved in that as well um and you can challenge them different ways so again if you do even have them standing at a cone um they might have to go to that color cone only or to the color cone of the pair person on the left um, but it's just getting them lots of ball contacts, bouncing the ball um, in a small bit of a chaotic environment where there's other people going around. So rather than the straight line of coming straight out um, and back, we're getting them going around where there's other people. So they have to be aware of the peripheral vision and stuff like that. A simple game, um, just working on bouncing the ball. For hurling, you'd obviously be dribbling the ball around the cones. So dribble the ball around three white cones. So they go around one white cone, two white cones, three white cones, back to their partner. Or if there's enough balls for everyone, they all do it together. Um, so again, Varying on space, and this is where again the good the coach you can leave the good kid. You know he's he's competent. You know he's doing it right. But you might have to go and work with a few of the weaker kids one on one, teach them, um, make sure they're holding the hurley correctly. Just give them a small bit of assistance that they might get. So rather than being in a straight line and slowing down everybody else, they're working with their own ball going at their pace. So the good kid might be doing, might be doing ten cones every thirty seconds. 
the weak kid might be doing three, but three is a success for them, and they're not being looked down on by their peers. Um, so it's a nice, simple game, um, but again, put in different variations of that. Have a coach standing around by the cones that they have to go past coaches, and coaches might be tackling stuff like that. So they're just small, simple variations, but it gets them lots of ball contacts again and a comfort with the ball. So for football, that they're bouncing, you can do it as they're throwing instead of bouncing. Um, in hurling, they'd be dribbling, they can put a bean bag on the hurling, they can solo dribble that or solo that around the cones. So simple things like that. Next one, um, another go to one for me, and especially in primary schools and coaching, is Rob the Nest. And Rob the Nest in, I think this game is done in a hurling format. Yeah, um, and it'd be similar in football. So for hurling, what they're doing is you've got four groups set up as is, you've got all the balls in the middle and as many balls as they can tennis balls, rubber balls, footballs, anything at all that you can get your hands on. The more balls, the better. And what the kids do is they run in, on the whistle they run in to get the balls from the middle, they bring them back to their square. Whichever team has the most amount of balls in their square is the winner. But after after 20 seconds or 30 seconds, once all the balls have gone out of the middle, the coach might blow the whistle and say you can rob, from, rob the nest. And what that means is you can go and you can steal a ball from each of the other team's squares. But you can only, you have to do the rules. Rules are one ball at a time. You're not allowed to pick the ball up. You're only allowed to dribble it on the ground. Um, stuff like that. In football, it's the exact same. Run in, get a ball, bounce it back every four steps, bounce and catch, bounce and catch, or you can throw and catch every four steps instead. But it's just a simple game um, where there's multiple ball contacts and lots of movement in a game setting. Small bit of pressure in that there. There's a speed element involved, but the kids generally love the idea of the game. Um, but just watch out that you'll have to set ground rules because the kids, in fairness to them, they'll come up with every cheat you could think of. They'll people lying on balls, they'd be shoving balls in behind, underneath cones and everything. So just be conscious of that and set the ground rules um, so that everybody's on the same wavelength. But again, kids love that, um, love that game as well. And I think I've got a video here now and I'll just show you the, the thing. So we got the four groups in the corners, all the balls in the middle, and all the rest of them. They're just dribbling the ball out. Again, this is where you can work one on one, help the kid who's struggling, and um, work and help them. The good kid might be doing two, three, four balls every 30 seconds. The weak kid might be struggling, might just get one, and it might take them a little bit longer. So, all the balls are gone from the middle here now, and the coach any second is going to give the blood a blood whistle to see you can rob. Now they're robbing already, but uh, it's obviously the kid's not, first, not their first time playing the game. So, now they can see the balls and see multiple movements. Um, we've got a couple of girls here in the close group are just protecting the balls um, but you want to encourage them to get out get the balls from the other area as fast as they can um, so if you'd, ideally if you'd a coach with each group and he or she is just going to be encouraging the kids to go and get another ball so that they're not waiting just protecting the ball so that they're, they're actually going and getting the ball so as they get progress older than you allow know, tackling and stuff like that um, but you can see a nice simple game um, with lots of ball contacts and the kids Kids just love that game as well. And again, with that last game, play it four or five times. Every team wins a game. Manipulate it, wait till, try to make sure that every team gets at least one win. Um, so they're all happy. Next one then is Croker Run, we call it. Suitable for hurling a football. Um, and again, hurling, this would be dribbling the ball along the ground. In football, you're bouncing every four steps. Uh, it's similar to bull, Bulldog, except with a ball. So you got all the kids lined up on one side. The, it could be the coach in the middle for the start, or the kids. And the kids have to solo, or not solo, but bounce four steps, every four steps, bounce the ball to the far line um, where they wait. But if the coach gets the ball off them, they become a catcher. So really simple game again, but it gives them a bit of ball context in a small bit of a pressured environment. I said if the coaches are doing the tackling, that's great. They're not going to get the ball off them. Leave the kids do five, six, seven, eight rows runs before they, they, you start taking the ball off them. And then the person who does lose the ball becomes a tackler, which is also another skill of the game, which they're going to be tackling, challenging. Um, Piggy in the middle, very simple. Um, in football, just, just getting them throwing the ball to each other. Uh, it just gets the concept of passing the ball, sharing the ball, getting them used to just communicating a small bit. Um, and it, it's just a very simple game that can be done in hurling. It can be the same to hitting the ball. They might go slightly further apart and hitting the ball past um, the piggy in the middle. And again, the piggy just stops the ball and, and keeps it. And then that person goes in the middle. So again, it's just a nice simple game um, that just gets the kids used to playing with a partner and passing the ball with somebody.
So just a few Twitter questions we had. Um, Terence McWilliams, renowned GA coach Munster. Um, what games would you start with initially and how would you progress them? So just going back on the games we played, the likes of No Man's Land, the likes of Rob the Nest, the likes of Goal to Goal, where, or the likes of Over the Bar, where you're getting the kids doing lots of contacts, lots of meaningful touches on the ball where they're playing hurling and football and they're kicking and striking are the core concepts. And I would put a huge emphasis on that. They're doing lots of those type of activities as opposed to small um, activities and drills. We do games such as No Man's Land where they're getting lots and lots of ball contacts. Um, friend of the page, Paul, just a positive comment again. Thanks, Paul. Um, Barry Kelly, what is your approach to coaching skills of the game at this age group? Which football skills do you deem appropriate and how do you coach them? So again, I suppose this goes back to what the, the start, the age appropriate skills that we would have had up. Um, I think keep it very, very simple. Uh, the good kids will, they'll progress themselves, they'll be playing themselves, they'll challenge themselves. But I think you've got to be very conscious of the kids that mightn't have to have a strong GA background or have brothers or sisters that play or have been, um, I suppose, exposed to playing hurling and football at a younger age, um, football in this instance for Barry. So what I would encourage is that you uh, age appropriate skills. So have a look at our list. See, do you think they work? Do they think they, do you change? Chop and change a small bit. As I said, it's a nice base, a nice guideline, but you can modify it to suit your own group better. But what I'd say is try to get every child hitting the basic minimum level of those skills by the end of the year. So you're coaching, if you're focusing on those three new skills this year, it'll make life a little bit easier for you as a coach to plan, but also for the kids that they're, they're not just going from one skill to different to different to different, that every week they're kind of focusing on these skills throughout the year. So if we're teaching a child a hand pass and we're doing it every single week for five or 10 minutes in some sort of a game setting or some sort of an activity, the kids will get very good at it very fast. Um, but just be patient with it. As I said, there's 20 kids of 18, 19, 20 years of developing before they become the senior hurler or senior footballer for the club. So don't be trying to do everything too soon. Um, how do I coach them? I use games where possible. So let's say for, for a hand pass, um, playing the likes of no man's land where they just hand passing the ball over and back across could be a nice start. Um, and again, that's where the coach works one on one um, with, with the weaker kids. Um, you could do knock the cones, you know, so target games. So rather than doing drills, which for hand pass ones, and I can, I can picture in my head is that I see it at warm ups for under eights and stuff like that before blitzes is the player would run out or the coach would line have the ball he'd line up five or six kids in front of him he'd throw the ball to the kids they catch it they hand pass the ball back to him um, that's grand in that you can see exactly what the kids are good at and how competent they are but for the child that's sixth in line or fifth in line and you're waiting 40 50 seconds you're kind of going can we utilize that time better so what I'd suggest is during games, if you do need to work on certain things with some players. So if you are playing a little match, you can pull out have a little skill box on the side. Um, and what you could do is bring out one or two kids at a time and that they're working on a particular skill. So for the good kids, you might be teaching them how to do a solo or how to hand pass the weekend. For the younger kids or for the weaker kids, um, it might just be going back to the basic of actually teaching them the, the key steps in a hand pass. Um, and as I said, if you're doing that in a game, you're not hindering everyone else's development. So the good kids are still being challenged accordingly, but the weak kids are getting their own challenge. So um, I'd say we're games based where possible um, and try to, as I said, there's loads of games out there and I'm sure you'll come up with your own games in that as well. Um, Cormac, another friend of the page. Um, ideas of dealing with disruptive kids and kids who don't pay attention, who can only focus for a few seconds. Um, this is, I suppose, just the, the age old question in every single workshop I do, I get asked this question. Um, how do we deal with disruptive, disruptive kids? What I would say with, especially with younger kids, is I don't think they're me. Well, I say this now and I've got one fella in my head bouncing, bouncing back at me to counteract my thoughts. But I suppose what I would say is try to keep it as game-based as possible. Where kids get bored is when they start being disruptive. So if we can keep them engaged for longer, um, then they're less likely to be to cause an hassle. So, if every child has a ball and they're doing something, no one knows it's going to be a few kids are just messers and whatnot. Um, but if they have a ball, they're going to be somewhat engaged with that. So think about how you can bring that into your training session. So I know some people are into disciplining them um, and taking them out, not letting them play and talking to their parents and stuff like that. But I'd say that's an extreme level. I'd like to think that just kids that are bored will, they'll be the ones that are disruptive. So it goes back to the last point that I was making. If you've got five kids in a line, the two or three at the back 
they're bored. They're looking for something to do. Um, so they're going to start messing with each other, um, which will take away the coaches. It'll stop you as a coach. You'll have to deal with them as opposed to dealing with the, the skill that you're trying to improve. Um, and it just, I can see how it would, ma- would, would make life tough for a coach. But if you can do something instead, rather than having five of them waiting, you have to have five of them playing, you shouldn't have those issues. So um, it's probably it's probably a little bit harder with the very young kids and that they, they're not as um, in tune with instructions and stuff like that. But I think the more games you can play, the better. So if something is, if you're doing a certain activity and it is causing trouble and every week you do it, the kids start acting up, you have to look at maybe what the content is. Um, and I said, look, that's utopian view that if we're better coaches, the kids will be better and all that. Um, and I know it's not it's not that easy. I know that for a fact. Um, but I know that if we can be a little bit better with the content that we're providing, the kids should respond better to it. Um, as I said, utopian view. But I do believe that if you can, if kids are engaged and they're challenged and there's a ball and there's something to chase after and something to run around and that they're getting a bit tired and they're under a bit of stress from the from the activities and they're they're getting a bit um out of breath is that they'll um they'll they'll start they'll start listening to what you're doing they'll be less likely to be messing but you have to keep it snappy don't be talking to the kids for two minutes when you can talk to them for 10 seconds and get them into the game um so there's just a few of them um one other on dm that came in was about boys and girls in nursery i think for nursery i think there's no reason why you can't have boys and girls um playing together I know as kids get older, I know club county board counties are getting much more proactive as regards pro games for girls and boys. So I would I would say it's not something that could should be discouraged. Um, allow boys and girls to train together. Another one was matches and training sessions. How much matches should you play in the nursery? And again, this is up to various clubs, very different opinions on it. I think I think there has to be some element of matches um, at every training session because the kids they they want to play matches. I always use the example that if, if there was 10 of us came down for a workshop inside here and we all had a kid each, a six-year-old or seven-year-old kid each, and we left him outside in the pitch while we were inside in the meeting room, would they do drills or would they do a match? They'd probably do a match of some sort. Um, so I'd encourage that they do give the kids that bit of uh, of fun that they, they kind of crave because we're trying to teach them how to play hurling and football so that they're good at hurling and football in matches uh, eventually. So let's start backtracking it that this is why they're here, so make sure to give them that. Um, and I think it goes back to the fun thing. I, I, lo- I wouldn't like to think a child is going home from training going, oh, we played no match today, Dad, or no match today, ma'am. Um, so give them that matches that, that they crave. Um, I said, look, there's different ideas on it, um, but that, that would be my own feeling on it, that you have to give them that bit of, uh, of a challenge in the matches. So I hope that answers some of those questions. Um, so tips for coaching kids. Um, I've got fun and enjoyment should be the priority. I've got that thrown in there three times because I do believe that rather than making them brilliant at hurling football, making them enjoy hurling football is more important at the start. Um, and if they enjoy it, they'll practice themselves, they'll engage more, they'll be more proactive when they're coming down to the training session. So make it fun and enjoyment that when they're down there, they look forward to getting down here and they want to be there. If it's fun, they'll want to come back, they'll want to practice. And as you go, as you progress, I suppose you get a small bit more buy-in from the kids as regards the content. But don't be too worried about making them the best hurler and footballer at the age of 5, 6 and 7. They've got, as I said, 14, 15 years to develop to become the, the, the star that you want them to be. Um, but make sure it's fun and enjoyment and that they come back. I'd say games are greater than drills. Um, again, it just goes back to the fun part. I know myself, if I had to go down training tomorrow night and we spent an hour doing drills, running around cones and short stuff, hand passing and jab lifting and uncontested I wouldn't be that engaged whereas if we were playing if we were doing games I'd be a lot more engaged so games appropriate to take the kids age ages group um queuing limit the amount of queuing that the kids have to do so no three four five sixes and lines waiting for a go can you change can you modify the activity so that they're all active all the time or as close as possible so that the most they're in is a group of three because if there's one person going one waiting um that'll all work out uh no waiting around while others others play so don't have kids standing around looking at at other people playing um when they could be, when they want to play themselves age appropriate content i've um, spoken to that already that you're not trying to teach a four-year-old how to solo hurling a football they don't need it yet teach them more important skills happy coach leads to happy players put on the smile um 
engage with the kids, have a joke, have a laugh with them, they'll respond to that. Instruct in the games the individual. So rather than stopping a game and having everybody talk, talking to the whole group as one, and everybody has to listen because one or two things happen in a game, talk to the individuals um, in the games and talk to them and explain to them, and hopefully that will make it easier. And keep talking to a minimum. It's a 30 second rule was something we've been told about 10, 12 years ago. That should be the maximum for kids. 30 seconds, move it on. The last one there is just a bunch of uh, um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, where you can find more information. Um, thanks very much for, for watching. I hope you get some benefit out of it, and any feedback is greatly appreciated. Thanks very much.